Okay. Um, can I have your attention, please? Um, one quick announcement before I begin, and that is to remind you that the coming Wednesday, you have your second midterm exam. And you already got an email from me giving you the details about the exam, and the same information is on the class website as well. Okay? I do want to remind you that please come to class on time. We will start the exam promptly on the hour, okay? And all of you have assigned seats, so it's important that you check and know exactly where your seat assignment is. And if you remember, there are multiple versions of the exam, so your seat number is associated with the exam that you get. So it's very, very important that you sit in the right seat and that you don't sit somewhere else. If you do, we will find out and that will be a zero on the exam, okay, because that will be considered um, cheating. Are there any questions before I begin? Yes, go ahead. It depends, all right? So her question was that in cell notation, do you need to include H pluses and OH minuses, all right? And let me think. It depends. If H plus and OH minus is part of the reaction, in other words, they undergo a change, a reduction or oxidation, then you would include them, all right? If not, you do not need to include them, all right? There are only two exceptions where you include them. Is like, I will show you those examples later on. It's like if you have manganate, an acidic solution of manganate, then you put H plus comma MnO4 minus, all right? And then there's another one where it's dichromate. Those reactions take place only if the solution is, you know, acidic, all right? And I will, I'm going to take some examples later on and show you that, okay? Other than that, you don't. If they're not part of the balanced equation, you don't include them, okay? Anything else? Okay, so getting back, oh, a reminder, there, there's a review for the second midterm exam. You already got an email from me giving you that information. The same information is on the class website as well, okay? Um, so if you remember, last time we talked about the fact that if you take a galvanic cell or a voltaic cell and the, the voltage that you measure on the voltmeter is called the cell potential, all right? And so if you take the cell potential, the symbol for the cell potential is E cell and this is the potential that you would measure. If it's under standard conditions, we said that then you would put the little knot on top and that would be E naught cell. And what that means is that under standard conditions for, um, um, for electrochemical devices, when you say standard conditions, what that means is that all solutions are at one molar concentration, if you have aqueous solutions, and all gases are at one atmospheric pressure. And usually we measure them at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, okay? And we finished up by saying that the relationship between delta G of the reaction is given by E negative NF E cell, if it's under non-standard conditions, the free energy change will be given by this. If it's under standard conditions, then the free energy change is given by E naught cell, all right? And then we moved on to talking about, so that's the relationship between free energy and the cell potential. Since voltaic cells take advantage of a spontaneous reaction, delta G is always negative. And if delta G is negative, then you can see that overall um, the cell potential comes out to be uh, positive, okay? 
Now, having said that, we later on went on to say that even though cell potential is what we measure using the voltmeter, it is convenient for us to break up the cell potential into two parts and to assign the contribution that comes from the anode half as well as the cathode half, all right? And so when we assign values to the contribution that comes from the cathode and anode, we call it the standard reduction potential. So this is the contribution that comes from each electrode separate. So we call this the standard reduction potential or standard electrode potential. All right, and the symbol we give it is E naught. Okay, and of course the unit is in volts. So it turns out that you can have a table of values and so this is what this table shows you. So this is an example of a table of standard reduction potentials and we write these all in the form of a reduction only. And the reason we do that is the analogy is just like remember we said that when you deal with acids we always list only the Ka values. If we needed Kb values, we just convert Ka to Kb and we know what the Kb value that corresponds to the conjugate base of that weak acid or that other acid, we can figure that out. Likewise, we have a table of only one value and those are listed as a reduction. So these are called standard reduction potentials, all right? Now if it is an oxidation, all we have to do is to reverse that reaction. All right, because when you write the equation, look at the top equation. You have fluorine plus two electrons giving you two F minus. The electrons are being picked up, that's a reduction. Now if I reverse that reaction so that two F minus gives you F2 plus electron, now electrons are being lost, do you see that? And so if I wanted the oxidation, all I would have to do is reverse the, re the equation and if you reverse the equation, then you change the sign on the reduction potential. Okay, and so it turns out that there are tables that have the standard reduction potentials of every conceivable half reaction that we can encounter. And these are usually listed so that the reduction potential started, starts with the largest positive value and then keeps decreasing as you go along. All right, and you can see the largest positive value is the top. At the bottom, we have the largest negative value. All right, and this is a typical standard reduction potential table. So what this gives you is that the contribution that a single electrode, a cathode for example, would give. Now we know the cell potential is made up of two components and therefore if we want the cell potential, then we know that the cell potential is given as follows. So the cell potential under standard conditions would be the sum of the contribution that comes from the cathode plus we need to add the contribution co that comes from the anode but remember these tables are always listed as a reduction. At the anode you have an oxidation. So what I need to do is I need to flip the sign so that now I have the contribution that comes from the anode. Do you understand why I put that negative sign? You have to add the contribution that comes from the cathode to the contribution that comes from the anode, but because these tables are always listed as a reduction for the oxidation half, where the, the anode is where the oxidation takes place, we need to reverse that equation, we need to reverse that sign, and therefore the negative sign is there to reverse that, okay? So let's take an example. And if I take an example of this cell notation. So we have this cell that we're looking at where we have Fe2 plus aqueous and Ag plus aqueous, Ag solid and let's say the cell potential that we would experimentally measure under standard conditions is 1.24 volts. So this cell notation tells us that this is the anode. Remember we always write the anode first. So this is the anode and this is the cathode. Therefore, my cell potential should equal the contribution that comes from the cathode, 
all right, which we know is the cathode plus we have to flip the sign and the cell potential that comes from the anode, all right. And therefore I can say at the cathode, the redox couple at the cathode is always the reduction. Remember when you write a redox couple, use a diagonal line, it's always the oxidized form first and the reduced form. So that will be the cathode plus on this side I'm going to reverse it, but now I would write the redox couple at the anode which would be that. Okay, so this would be the contribution that comes from the cathode, this would be the contribution that comes from the anode. So if I wanted to figure that out, I can go to this table over here and we'll start with the cathode is the silver. So that's where the reduction takes place. So on this table, I'm going to look for silver going to silver solid. Okay, so here you can see that that comes out to be, can everybody see that? The value is 0 0.80. So from this table, I can get the contribution that comes from the cathode which is 0 0.80. So this would be 0 0.80 zero volts and if you wanted to keep track of sine, that would be a positive value plus now I need to look at the contribution that comes from ion, ion two plus. So now I go to this list and I'm going to look for ion two plus, um, ion, this is ion, here we are. So this is the contribution that comes from the other reaction which is this is the oxidation part, so this is the reduction reaction. So I need to take this value which is negative and so I'm going to flip the sign so that now this is plus 0 0.44 volts, all right? So that was, did you guys get that? From the table it was a negative value, I'm going to flip the sign. So now you can see I end up with 1.24 volts which is the value that I measure. All right, and so you can figure out what the cell potential would be under standard conditions by taking the two halves of the electrodes and adding them together, keeping in mind that there's a reduction at the cathode and there's an oxidation at the anode. Now if I wanted to write an equation that represented the same thing, I could also write this in the form of an equation and so we'll start with the cathode. Cathode is where the reduction takes place. So at the cathode I have silver plus going to silver. So I have Ag plus aqueous going, uh, sorry, picking up electron, giving you Ag solid. And the reduction potential that corresponds to this would be the Ag plus Ag redox couple which gives me plus 0 0.80 volts. At the anode, I would have the oxidation and so for the oxidation I have ion solid going to ion two plus, plus two electrons, okay? And this represents the redox couple, ion two plus ion. And since this is an oxidation I need to reverse the sign, I take the value from the table which is negative 0.44 and I'm going to flip the sign so that I end up with that, okay? Now if you want to look at the overall reaction, you can see that two electrons are given off. Therefore, I need to pick up two electrons. So you can see I need to multiply this equation by two because when I sum them up, the number of electrons given off have to equal the number of electrons taken up. And therefore the balanced equation for this would be 2Ag plus aqueous plus ion solid giving me 2 Ag solid plus ion 2 plus. And since I'm adding these two equations together, now I get the cell potential which is plus 0 0.80 volts plus 0 0.44 volts which is 1.24 volts. Did you guys get that? All right, yes. Um, when you're listing the 
potential for the anode? Should we put it? Should we switch the sign when we're listing it? Yes, I think you should switch the sign right away. All right, because otherwise you forget it. All right, you should be switching it as soon as you look at it, because very often students, if they keep it till later, usually forget to do that. Okay. Now keep in mind. Remember last time we said. Reduction potentials, cell potentials are intensive properties. What does that mean? They don't depend on the amount of substance. That's why I'm multiplying this first equation by two. I'm multiplying it by a coefficient two to balance the number of electrons that are given off. But I do not multiply this by two. If it was free energy, change in free energy, I would multiply it by two. Do you understand that? If it was change in enthalpy, I would multiply it by two because they are extensive properties. But here, we know that cell potentials and reduction potentials, standard reduction potentials are intensive properties. They don't depend on the amount of substance and that's why we don't multiply it by two. We just add them together, okay? Now, I want to remind you guys that these reduction potentials can't be measured, all right? What we can measure is, in reality, just the cell potential. So how do we assign values? How do we assign relative values for the relative contributions that each electrode contributes if we can't measure it, all right? And the way we do that is we pick a standard and our standard is the hydrogen electrode. So by default, our standard is the hydrogen electrode. And if you take the hydrogen electrode, the standard reduction potential, so the hydrogen electrode, the redox couple is H plus going to H2, and this is assigned a value of zero volts. All right, so that we start with that. And now that we start with this, now we take a cell that has a hydrogen electrode. So let's say we take zinc solid, zinc two plus aqueous, giving me H plus um, aqueous H2 platinum solid. We take this cell and now we can measure the cell potential. It turns out if you measure the cell potential in the standard conditions, you can measure this experimentally, it comes out to be 0.76 volts, all right? So if this is 0.76 volts, then we know that the cell potential is the sum of the cathode. So our cathode is H plus H2 redox couple plus minus our anode, which is the zinc 2 plus zinc redox couple. All right, so I know that this is plus 0.76 volts. I know that the hydrogen electrode is the standard, so I'm going to assign a value of zero to that, plus this is a negative sign, plus times negative will give me a negative. It gives me this equation. If I rearrange this, you can see that if I take this redox couple at the anode, I know this comes out to be 0.76 volts. All right, so because the hydrogen electrode has a value of zero, now I have a reduction potential for the zinc couple, all right? Remember, since I put a negative sign here to account for the anode, what I get here is actually the reduction reaction, all right? And so if you turn to the table that I showed you, now you can see, let me just enlarge this a little bit. So what I've done is, in yellow, I've highlighted the standard. So the hydrogen electrode has a reduction potential of zero. Now based on the fact that this is arbitrarily assigned a value of zero and we're going to use that as our standard, now if I go to the zinc couple that we just looked at, which is, um, where is zinc? I've got to look at this table. Here we are. Can you see? The calculated value is 0.76 volts and we figure that out by assigning, we can measure the cell potential. If you have a hydrogen electrode there, you assign a value of zero and from that you can figure out what the value is for the zinc couple, all right? Now that I know this, now that I figured out zinc, now I can take the Daniel cell. So you can see this is the way you mix and match 
and find the right combination so that you can assign values to everything. So now that I know that the zinc couple is negative 0.76 volts, now I go to the Daniel cell and the Daniel cell is zinc 2 plus aqueous copper solid, copper 2 plus actually, aqueous vertical copper solid, all right? And if you measure the cell potential for this, it comes out to be 1.10 volts. All right, so now I move to the Daniel cell and now I know the value for this is negative, seven point, negative 0.76. I can figure out what that is. So now I go to this and I can say E naught cell equals the cathode is copper 2 plus copper combination plus I'm going to flip the sign for the reduction potential for zinc which is zinc 2 plus zinc couple, all right? And so I know this value is 1.10 volts, all right? This is what we want to find, copper plus, now I'm going to flip the sign. Remember previously we found out that this was negative 0.76 and therefore if I take that value now it becomes positive 0.76 volts. All right, therefore my copper couple, Cu2 plus Cu redox couple would have a reduction potential of 1.10 volts minus 0.76 volts which comes to be, turn out to be something like what, 0.34. So this will be plus 0.34 volts. All right, so now that I know that you can go to the table and we return to this table and we look for the copper 2 plus copper value, you can see that comes out to be positive 0.34 volts. So do you guys understand how we figure out because we can't experimentally measure redox potentials because the galvanic cell has, comes as one unit. You can't separate the cathode from the anode. They have to be together by assigning one of these electrodes the standard value of zero everything else can be measured relative to that, all right? And it turns out that these redux, um, reduction potentials are listed in tables. So some tables look like this. I just want to point out that there are different kinds of tables. So you'll see, uh, you know, if you go to the CRC handbook, you'll see re reduction potentials, standard reduction potentials listed out for every conceivable half reaction that you can encounter. So they're either listed like this, and they're always listed in this order where you start it with the highest positive value, it goes to zero and then goes to the highest negative value, okay? Another way that they're listed is like this and in some books you'll see this and over here they actually give you the redox couple, all right? So they list the redox couple. And somebody asked me, when do you list out when you have H pluses? So you'll see here, you list out H plus because this reaction takes place. The value that you measure, shown here, is when that solution is acidic. When the reaction takes place, either it can take place in an acidic solution or basic solution. And so you'll see when this reaction takes place in an acidic solution, you'll see H plus listed, okay? And then there's another one here. This is under acidic conditions and so if whenever the reaction is under acidic conditions, you'll see that the hydrogen is listed in the redox couple, all right? And so one way to figure it out is to just look at the table, all right? And these are the redox couples on one side. You can see the reduction half reactions and then over here you can see that the reason that some of these ha you have to indicate whether it's acidic or basic, you can see that these voltages depend on pH, all right? And so the voltage that you list will depend on the pH of the solution and that's why you have to indicate whether it's acidic or basic, right? So if it does depend on the pH, you'll see those values listed as well, okay? And that's why you have to indicate H plus. But those are rare ones. In most cases, you do not have to include the H plus or OH minus. It's only those that depend on the pH. Their voltage will depend on, the reduction potentials will depend on the pH. All right? So here's another way it's listed. And once again, you can see that zero is in the middle. Okay? 
Now, there's one problem. If you look at the worksheet, there's one problem here that I just worked without looking at the problem, but you can see the standard reduction potential for the zinc electrode is this and the standard potential for this cell is 1.10 volts. This is, remember, this is the Daniel cell. What is the standard potential for the copper electrode? That's just what we just calculated, all right? Uh, and so you can encounter questions where you're given the cell potential and you're given one of the cathode anode potential, all right, the reduction potential for either the cathode or anode and you should be able to figure out what the reduction potential for the other is. Or if you're given that table, then you can look up the standard reduction potentials and you can calculate the cell potential that you would measure if you put those two halves together, okay? Now we're going to move on to looking at one of the most important applications of these tables that we have of the standard reduction potentials. And so we're going to look at the significance of standard reduction potentials. All right, the significance of standard reduction potentials and sometimes we call this the electrochemical series. All right, and I want to remind you that this electrochemical series is the table that we just looked at, this table of reduction potentials, standard reduction potential sorted by starting from the highest standard reduction potential value, the highest positive value going down to zero and then negative numbers going to the highest negative number, okay? Now the standard, the electrochemical series are very similar to our table of Ka values. Remember the Ka values, the table of Ka values are used to rank relative acid based strengths. So you know that you can look at the table and you can rank acids based on which is a stronger acid, which is a weaker acid and which is a stronger base and weaker base, all right? Likewise, we can use the electrochemical series or this table of standard reduction potentials to rank substances based on whether they are a stronger oxidizing agent or a stronger reducing agent. Okay, in order to do this, I have put a handout on the class website and I would like you to print it out and when you're studying, um, look at this often. So I'm going to start by, so let's take a look at, I want to make it as big as possible, there we are. So remember these are all reactions that are written in the form of a reduction. Okay, so these are standard reduction potentials. So when a substance undergoes a reduction, so let's take the top equation. This is in the form, this is the substance that undergoes a reduction. When a substance go, undergoes a reduction, what kind of agent is it? Remember it's always the opposite, it's an oxidizing agent because it's the re agent that's responsible for oxidizing its partner, all right? So this is the one that's undergoing the reduction and if it's undergoing the reduction, it is the oxidizing agent, all right? So on the left hand side, you would have, in the way that reaction is written, you'll have the oxidizing agent, got it? On the right hand side, remember if we flip that reaction around, a reduction reaction now becomes an ox oxidation. So if I take the reverse reaction, so the forward reaction, this would be the oxidizing agent. If I reverse this reaction, I flip it around, now this is undergoing a reduction, all right? I'm sorry, it's undergoing an oxidation. This is undergoing a reduction, this will undergo an oxidation because when this reacts to give you this, it's producing electrons, can you see that? And therefore the reverse reaction, this would be the one that undergoes oxidation. For the reverse reaction, if this is undergoing oxidation, then it is the reducing agent. Can everybody see that? So when you write these reactions, half reactions in the form of a reduction, anything on the left hand side is the oxidizing agent for the forward reaction and anything that's on the product side, on the right hand side is the reducing agent for the reverse reaction, 
All right? So we can write this in this general form of reaction where you, ha you have the oxidizing agent. The oxidizing agent can pick one or more electrons to give you the reducing agent. All right? And so for the forward reaction, this is the oxidizing agent. For the reverse reaction, this is the reducing agent. Got it? So now if you take these tables, the way they are ranked is that anything that has a large positive reduction potential would have the strongest oxidizing agent on this side. All right? So if you look at the ranking on the left hand side as in this table as you go further and further up, it becomes a stronger and stronger oxidizing agent. Can everybody see that? And, and the way you look at it is look at the reduction potentials. Anything that has a large positive value would be a stronger oxidizing agent on the left hand side than something below. All right? So if I wanted to compare oxidizing agents, you can see that if I'm comparing um, chlorine and copper, which would be a stronger oxidizing agent? Cl2. Can everybody see that? Now if you're given four compounds, you're given this, 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 and this. All right? So this is the reactant product, reactant product. And you're asked to rank these in terms of strongest oxidizing agent to the weakest oxidizing agent. So can everybody see this would be the strongest oxidizing agent. This would be the next strongest. Now on the other side, these are actually reducing agents. But can you see that? So the order would be if you're ranking them, you're going from oxidizing agents. These are reducing agents. But if you're ranking them, you'd say this is the strongest. Next would come this. Next would come that and then next will come that. Do you see that? Because this is a strong reducing agent. If it's a strong reducing agent, then it has to be a really weak oxidizing agent. Do you see that? And therefore if you were to rank all four of these, this would be the one, next comes this, next comes that, and then next comes that. If you're not given these two and you're just asked to rank these two, you'd say this is the stronger oxidizing agent, this will be the weaker one. All right? And if you're given like three or four compounds to compare, what you do is you look at this table, and you make sure that the standard reduction potentials are listed so that it starts from the largest positive value and decreases and you know that that will be the stronger oxidizing agent. Okay? Now if you look at reducing agents, now remember for reducing agents you have to look at an oxidation. So on this side, now this is going this way in the reverse direction. These are all reducing agents. All right? But now the strongest reducing agent would be down here and the weakest reducing agent would be up there. So, so if you're looking at reducing agents, then the reaction has to be an oxidation. And for the oxidation, anything on the right hand side, the lowest one will be the strongest reducing agent and anything on top would be the weakest reducing agent. So if you were given copper, chlorine, copper, this and this. You can see that copper will be the strongest reducing agent. Next comes this, next comes this, and next comes that. Do you see that? If you're ranking them in terms of reducing agents, the strongest oxidizing agent will be the weakest reducing agent. Do you see that? And therefore, if you're ranking them, then this would be the stronger one, then comes that, then comes that, and then that would be the last one. Okay? Or if you're just looking at only these, then anything at the lower end would be a stronger reducing agent and that would be a weaker reducing agent. Do you understand that? So if you just see this visually in this way, then it helps you when you're given a question about ranking compounds in terms of which would be a stronger oxidizing agent or which would be a weaker oxidizing agent or which would be a stronger reducing agent. All you have to do is have this picture in mind and that helps you. Okay? And so what you do is you make use of electrochemical series and this is what the electrochemical series are. Electrochemical series is just the table. Table listing out reduction potential starting from the largest positive value and it just decreases as you go down. And so you can use this and now you understand just like we can rank acids using the Ka values, we can rank oxidation reduction reactions uh, on, the, uh, on the basis of oxidizing agents or reducing agents using the electrochemical series as well. Okay? So now let's take some examples of applying this. So this handout is on the class website, the examples that we're working on. So um, don't copy this because you can just print it out. All right? So let's say 
we're going to apply what we just learned. Okay? So is an acidified permanganate solution a more powerful oxidizing agent than an acidified dichromate solution under standard conditions? Okay? So here we're using some words and names of compounds that you haven't encountered before. But you need to know that permanganate means, and you've seen um, this in laboratory as well, this is permanganate ion. And Cr, Cr2072 minus is called the dichromate ion. Okay, so what we're looking for in our ranking is these ions. So they want us to know whether the permanganate solution is, is more powerful oxidizing agent than a dichromate solution. And remember, these are one of those examples of reactions that actually depend on the pH. And that's why they tell you it's acidified. Okay? So if we're going to apply this, then we have to turn to the electrochemical series. And so in this electrochemical series, we now have to look for permanganate ion. Okay? So we look for the relative position of the permanganate ion. There's permanganate ion in acidified solution. All right? And you can see that the reduction potential is plus 1.51. Now that's one of our reactants. All right? What is the other one we want to look for? Dichromate right there. So you can see that anything on top on the left hand side should be a stronger oxidizing agent than anything below. So between permanganate and dichromate, which is a stronger oxidizing agent? Permanganate. All right? So your answer would be yes. Permanganate is a stronger oxidizing agent than dichromate because in the electrochemical series, it goes on top. Or you can look at the reduction potentials and you can see that permanganate has a larger positive standard reduction potential than the dichromate and therefore your answer would be yes. All right? Now let's take the second example. So this is just straightforward, yes or no, or if you're asked to rank them, you would rank manganese as a stronger oxidizing agent than permanganate. Now if we go to the second one, um, I'm purposely taking, you know, there are much more easier questions, but I just want to take some examples where um, it's a little bit more, there is a pH dependence as well. And so, once again, um, let's take another example. Now this is a little bit more complicated. Oops, sorry. So let's take a look at this. Can aqueous KMnO4 be used to oxidize iron 2 to iron 3 under standard conditions in acidic solution. So the next question is slightly more different. We're asked, can we use KMnO4 to oxidize iron 2 to iron 3? So if I, can, if I wanted to use KMnO4 to oxidize, then which is the oxidizing agent? Who is oxidizing? If I say, it's all in the wording, okay? I'm not saying K iron is undergoing oxidation. I'm saying KMnO4 is oxidizing iron. So if KMnO4 is oxidizing iron, who is undergoing the oxidation? Iron. So who is undergoing the reduction? KMnO4. If KMnO4 is undergoing the reduction, is that the oxidizing agent or the reducing agent? Oxidizing, oxidizing agent. You got it? So it's all in the wording and students get thrown off. So you've got to read it a couple of times because they're asking you, can KMnO4 oxidize iron 2 to iron 3? So that means iron 2 and iron 3 are oxi being oxidized. So that's the oxidation. Therefore, KMnO4 has to be the reduction, and therefore KMnO4 has to be the oxidizing agent. All right? So when you're studying, make sure you clarify what the, the wording is. They can use the word oxidation, which is different from oxidizing which is different from oxidizing agent. So oxidizing agent and oxidizing go together. All right? Oxidizing, the word oxidizing is the same as oxidizing agent or oxidizing something else. Oxidation and reduction are different. Got it? So make sure you clarify when you read the question. So 
So what, what, what they're telling us is can KMnO4 act as the oxidizing agent for ion 2 to ion 3? So let's go back to the table. So you have to, you can't answer this question without looking at the electrochemical series. So that's permanganate. It's got a large standard reduction potential. Now I have to look for ion 2 going to ion 3. So this is, here we are. This is the redox couple ion 3, ion 2. Remember this is the reduction, therefore this has to be the oxidation. So this equation is actually reversed. So you have ion 2 plus going to ion 3. All right? So if I compare these two, which is a stronger oxidizing agent? This is the stronger oxidizing agent. This is the weaker, I mean stronger reducing agent. This would be the weaker oxidizing agent. Do you see that? So that means if anything on top, when you're looking at this electrochemical series, anything on top will always undergo reduction and anything below that will always undergo oxidation. So you have to reverse that. Okay? So what would your answer be? Would it oxidize ion 3, uh, would it oxidize ion 2 to ion 3? Yes, because MnO4 is a strong oxidizing agent. Now I want to show you, if they ask you to write a balanced equation, now let's, do, let's look at how you write a balanced equation. So we know that for the top equation, we know that this is what happens at the cathode. So we know the cathode is the site of the reduction and we know the oxidizing agent will undergo reduction. So And I know this would be plus 1.51 volts, okay? So this is the cathode and it's undergoing a reduction, okay? Now what happens at the anode? It's the oxidation. So now we're going to go down to ion 3 plus ion 2. You have to be careful when you look at these series because you can have ion 3 going to ion 2. You can have ion 3 going to ion metal, all right? And you can have iron 2 going to iron metal. Do you see that? So you have to make sure when you go through this table, you pick the appropriate one. So here we're looking at iron going from a 3 plus charge to iron 2 plus. But now we want to look at oxidation. So what do I have to do to this equation? I have to reverse it. So if I reverse it, now I would have Fe2 plus, okay, um, Fe2 plus, uh, giving me Fe3 plus plus an electron and this would be, now I need to reverse that sign so this will be negative 0.77 volts. All right, so now if I want to combine them to look at the overall reaction, five electrons are given off, so how many do I need to multiply this by? Five. So my balanced equation would be MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5Fe2 plus would give me Mn2 plus plus 4H2O plus 5Fe3 plus and my cell potential would be plus 1.51 volts plus negative 0.77 volts and that would be your overall cell potential for that reaction. Do you understand that? All right, so either you can use E cathode plus flip the sign for the anode or you can just flip the sign right there and add them together and you would end up with the overall cell potential that you would expect for that setup, okay? All right, now we can move on to, so, so you should expect questions where you're asked to rank relative oxidizing agents or more importantly, you should be able to give in a whole list of substances, elements or ions, you should be able to rank them in terms of relative oxidizing agents or relative strengths of reducing agents or pick the one that would be the strongest oxidizing agent or pick the one that is the strongest reducing agent. Got it? Okay. Now we're going to move on to looking at the relationship between standard potentials and equilibrium constants. So we're going to look at the relationship 
between the standard cell potential and the equilibrium constant k. Well, OK? So we're going to derive an expression for the relationship between the standard cell potential and the equilibrium constant. Now if you guys remember in thermodynamics when we looked at free energy, what is the relationship between free energy and the equilibrium constant? You guys remember this equation that we derived last quarter? Delta G naught reaction equals minus RT L and K. All right, so this gives you the relationship between the equilibrium constant and the free energy. All right, now we know that delta G naught reaction is also NF E naught cell. So the free energy under standard conditions is related to the cell potential according to this equation. So now if I take this and put it over there, I can say NF E naught cell equals negative RT L and K. All right, the two negative signs will cancel out on either side. So I can say that E naught cell equals RT over NF, all right, times ln K. All right, so this is the relationship between the two. Now if you look at this, can everybody see that R is a constant, Faraday constant, if we keep the temperature constant at room temperature, then these values are constants. All right? So All right? So I can either write this this way or I want to remind this, but I also want you to remind you that we can either write this equation this way. If we want to calculate cell potential, the relationship between cell potential and L and K would be given by that. If I want to calculate L and K, L and K would be NF over RT L and K. All right, so depending on, sorry, E naught cell. All right, so I can write these equations in either way. And in either one of these, we know that R is a constant. So you can see that this, this, and this, these terms, as long as you're at room temperature, these terms will remain the same. So R, remember, is 8.3145 joules per Kelvin per mole. The Faraday constant is 9.6. 485 times 10 to the power 4 coulombs per mole. Temperature, remember most thermodynamic calculations are done at 25 degrees Celsius, which is considered to be room temperature. And if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, then temp absolute temperature in Kelvin would be 298.15 Kelvin. So if you want to add 273.15, if you really want to be precise, then it would be room, at room temperature, this would be 298.15 Kelvin. Now if I take all of this and put them together, then it turns out that RT over F would be 0 0.025693 volts. All right? So that means this equation now can be written as, if you want to calculate the cell potential, this would be 0 0.025693 volts divided by N, L and K. And this equation would be L and K equals N over 0, 0 0.025693 volts. E naught cell. Do you see that? 
So what this equation gives you is the relationship between the self potential and the equilibrium constant. So you can calculate the equilibrium constant given the self potential or vice versa. So if you set up a galvanic cell and if you measure the self potential under standard conditions, now you can calculate the equilibrium constant. All right? And so I will stop there for today and next time we'll take an example where we're applying this equation. Okay?